pals. Let's go ahead and get started. So, good morning and welcome to our Hive stream. Today's program is made possible by the Museum of Life and Science. This morning, uh, you'll be chatting with me. My name is Max and I have my friend Jenna. Hi. And then we also have two pals down here in the bottom. Do you all want to introduce yourselves and tell us where you are? Sure. I'm Mackenzie. I'm an entomologist here at the Museum of Life and Science. Right now, we're in a back support hall that's not normally open to the public, but this is where we keep all of our equipment, take care of everything around the garden. That sounds great. And I'm Peregrine. I'm here to uh, I'm here to film this exciting live stream. This is going to be so much fun. So for y'all, what we'd love for you to do is participate by making observations, so telling us what you observe and see and notice, and by asking questions in the chat box over here. Now, we are in a webinar format, which means you're not going to be able to see or hear yourself, but you're going to be able to hear all of the cool stuff that the rest of us are doing during this program, during our Hive check. While you are using the chat box, just a few things to keep in mind. First of all, let's be uh, kind and considerate and remember that there are likely a lot of children present in this program, which should help to inform the type of language that you are using while you're chatting with everybody. Remember that Zoom gives us a whole lot of functionality and allows us to remove participants if we need to, but I don't really think that we will need to today. We welcome all ideas that are founded in respect and we would love to hear from you. So as we are going through our program today, please feel free to let us know what you're seeing, what you're noticing, what you're observing, and whatever questions you have come up. Jenna and I love bees. I love bees. What do you think, Jenna? I absolutely love bees. I even have a tattoo of a bumblebee. Oh, I did not know that. That is really cool. But we are not bee experts. Mackenzie down here is probably the most bee expert out of all of us. So even though all of us love bees, there are probably questions that you're going to ask that we don't know the answers to. And we'll tell you that if that's the case. So keep that in mind as you are thinking up your questions. And we'll try to get to as many of them as we possibly can in our short program today. All right, Jenna, can you think of anything else we should talk about before we get started? I think that's wonderful, Max, everything that you said. I love it. Okay. Well then, uh, oh, Peregrine, can you think of something we should say before we get started? Uh, I think let's uh, get started, everybody, and we will. <laughs> <laughs> How could you? I think we're going to get suited up. Mackenzie and I are going to get suited up and head out to the hive without further ado. Okay. So to get into a beehive safely, we need some special clothing, protective clothing. So that's what we're going to be putting on right now. So this is a bee suit, all tucked up in there. Guys, why are you, why do you need those protective clothings? Well, I think one of the main things people know about bees is that they sting. And why they normally will not sting you if you're not bothering them. What we're about to do is invade their home. So they're going to feel very protective of their home where they live. And there's always a possibility that we could get stung during that process. Wearing clothing with long sleeves and long pants will protect us from getting stung. Perfect on a summer day. <laughs> yeah, they can get quite toasty though. So I'm only half suiting up for now. We put the rest on when we go outside. Oh, someone has a question for you guys. Uh, okay. Don't you guys get hot in your protective clothing? Absolutely, yeah. It gets it gets pretty stuffy. So Sometimes, you know, beekeepers have the option to how comfortable you feel. You can not wear this whole suit. You can just wear a veil around your head because your head is the most sensitive spot to get stung in general. So if it's, if it's super hot, that's always an option. Do these clubs go under or over? Under. Under. And I, I, I saw a question that I want to answer, and it said something about the color of the suit. Yeah. Being white, and that is really important. So, Bees can be more wary of dark colors, especially um, like black, because they sense that it could be a bear, like a black bear 
coming to invade their hive. So it's always a good idea to wear really light colors when you're in the bees. Wow, I did not know that. That is really cool. Yeah. One thing yeah. that I think is really fascinating about that hive destruction by black bears, and I had thought for a <laughs> long time that sort of like Winnie the Pooh or the fact that the bear in making up that, that little package of honey meant that the bears were going after the honey in the hives. Those bears are actually going after the really protein rich larva. So they are mostly going in to eat the bees yeah. themselves rather than the honey, which I think is fascinating. Yeah, absolutely. And it just happens to be wrapped in a little sweet package of honey as well. <laughs> we, we got some, sorry, go ahead, Mackenzie. Let's show you the rest of our equipment and then we're going to head outside. Uh, so, someone would like to know if you're nervous. I'm not nervous. No, I've been, uh, I've been beekeeping for uh, almost 10 years now. So I, I don't really get nervous anymore. Peregrine, are yeah. you nervous? I mostly feel excited. I feel really excited to do this. This is the very first time that I will be uh, approaching a beehive in this way. So I'm excited. It's amazing. Yeah, it's really, it's really special. Um, so we should make sure we have all the equipment we need to go outside. And I'll, we'll kind of go over what they're for, maybe outside. This is the smoker. We have our five tools. So this helps us get into the hive to like break open the boxes and the frames because they're very sticky and we'll talk about them more outside. And then we have a lighter, it's a lighter smoker. And smoker fuel, which is just pine needles. Mm -hmm. so we have all our equipment so we'll start heading outside answer any questions on our way out. Awesome. I'm going to switch our camera really quick so that um, I can get my glove on. So you'll be seeing some equipment behind you for just a second until I pick up that camera. This is We're a cool behind the scenes at the butterfly house too. You're seeing all behind sorts of... Behind the scenes. Wow, Jenna. Behind the scenes. Thank you for that. Uh, <laughs> Adeline, you. Cecilia, and Colette would like to know, have you gotten stung before? Um, <laughs> absolutely. I've been stung. Dozens and dozens of times. Not all at the same time, though. <laughs> Over the course of many years. While y'all are walking outside, uh, Jenna, something that I think is really cool about bees is that while right now we are heading over to uh, do a hive check for our European honeybee hives, they're, they only make up one species out of more than 20,000 different species of bees. Yeah. Uh, which includes many, many more species that are native to here in North America, unlike our uh, European honeybees. I think it's really fascinating that out of these um, more than 20,000 species of bees, there are 500 or so that, that have no stingers, no uh, species of bees that, that cannot sting you at all. And that most yeah. other species are very, very, very unlikely to sting you. And we, of course, know our European honeybees because of their reputation to sting. I'm sure that Mackenzie and Peregrine will talk a little bit more about that. But I thought that that was a really fascinating piece that not, it's not only that not all bees do sting, not all bees can sting, which I think is pretty interesting. I thought when you were speaking about stinging, that made me also think about all the different kinds of bees that there are. And that we often, when we think about bees, we always kind of have that image of bees in their hive making honey. But most bee species are actually live solitary. They make their own little nests, either in a hive or in a ground nest, which I think is really, really neat. So Mackenzie, what are you doing right now? I'm getting my smoker ready. So I just put some, some pine needles in the bottom and about to light it. Very intense way of lighting something, <laughs> but it's very effective. Mackenzie, can I ask, why do you use a smoker? What is it for? I thought you would never ask that. <laughs> so the smoke emulates or mimics a forest fire. It makes the bees think that there is danger. So that makes them stop whatever they're doing, which may be some sort of aggressive behavior, and instead gorge on their food, their honey. So it just distracts them. That's one reason. The other reason is if we were to get stung, we would smoke that area where you got stung because that bee leaves an alarm 
pheromone alarm smell that calls the other bees in the hive over to where that smell is where you got stung and you could get stung more and more in that same spot but the smoke makes that smell kind of go away that's really interesting. Peregrine and I, when we were doing our summer bug out with our friend, Dr. Eleanor, learned a little bit about how bees communicate, like you just said, partially through smell. And I've heard something really interesting about that uh, alarm smell. Is there something interesting you'd like to tell us about what that smells like? No. Do you have, I have something? Heard, <laughs> I have heard that, that to some folks, the alarm, uh, pheromone that that they put out smells like bananas which i think is interesting um there is <laughs> there's something that you spray on bees when you're trying to harvest the honey that's called like bee, bee gone and you spray it and it makes the bees disperse and i think it smells like bananas now that you said that there must be some connection to that but i've never thought that in the hive that it hmm. smells like bananas Peregrine and Mackenzie, somebody asked, where are you right now at the museum? I'm sure there's plenty of people that are watching that, uh, that are familiar with the museum, but may not have ever seen the area where you are. So if you, maybe with a parent that's been, been at the museum for a while, this is the old uh, Carolina Butterfly Pavilion. So this used to be the native butterfly garden. It wasn't closed. But several years ago, you know, they, they closed this part down. So we're behind the butterfly house, um, kind of where if you go to Santa Train is, kind of back in that, one of those gardens. So this is not an area that's accessible to the public. Okay. So it looks like you've got your smoker ready. What are you getting ready to do now? I am getting ready to make sure I am secure, all dipped up, no places to go. Let me see, I can try and help you here. So we have this wonderful hood. Uh, it is uh, it is zipped, yes. And I might ask you to help me as well, Mackenzie, if you, if you could. I'll hold my breath while you do it. Yeah. Jenna, we had an excellent <laughs> question in here. Do bees drink water? I did see that question. It's a really good um, question. Yeah, bees do drink water. I, yeah, I, bees, it's... It's really important to give your bees a source of water. So they actually really like kind of smelly water. So just really clean water from your, your filter is not even what they prefer. So they like going to like ponds and, and creeks and just little mud puddles. And even um, if you see your bees at swimming pools a lot, it's because they smell that chlorine and it's such a, such a strong smell. All right, I am all dipped up, no places to go. Perfect. And I'm going to check Peregrine here, make sure Perfect. they're okay. Thank you. And, and while you do that, I am checking out where we will head. Thank you so much. I've got my hands full of camera. There's a really great question um, from one of our attendees asking, is the honey edible when it's still in the hive? Yes, it is. So we'll, we'll show you what part you can eat when we get in there. All right, here we go. Here we go. I'm excited. I'm feeling a little bit nervous. <laughs> I'm just excited. You can stand here. So we're gonna give a gentle smoke to the entrance. Oh, look but at I all those bees. All of them. Try open. bees already. Wow. So we use this because bees make something called propolis. It's very, it's like sticky tack. It's very, very hard and very, very sticky. And they use it to close all the spaces in their hive. So they don't like to have extra space anywhere. So they use it to plug things up. But every time you use a hive, you have to open it again because they've, they've glued everything together essentially. So I see a lovely frame that we're going to try to look at. I 
I can hear them um, beginning to buzz, uh, like you were saying. They feel a little bit threatened, so they're buzzing a little bit more loudly. And I have some flying around my head. But I'm well protected by my suit. Ooh, here comes a cool frame. This is a frame that is full of almost honey. And this is this is heavy. This is what maybe 20 pounds or so. And this is where see it's, it's dripping out honey. So we know when honey is done, when it's tapped. So right now all of these cells are open, which means it still has too much water in it. So bees visit a flower, we get nectar from it. They come back and regurgitate it into the cell, but that nectar has a very high water content, which would make it spoil if bees didn't do anything about it. So the bees evaporate out that water in the cells, and they know when that moisture content is just right, and when it is, they seal it over, they cap it, they preserve it. And it's good, you know, we know <laughs> from a lot of stories recently that the honey can be good for hundreds of thousands of years. That's very true. I know that there's uh, uh, honey from Egyptian tombs as grave goods that are still viable, still good to eat. So generally, the, the topmost box of a, of a hive is usually just the food. Bees like to keep their food and their brood, which are the baby bees, separate. So in general, all I expect to find here on the top is food. We'll, we'll check out a couple more frames just to make sure. So right now it looks like uh, Mackenzie is pulling out some of the pieces of our hive here to look over them to make sure that they are healthy. And you're using your hive tool right now, Mackenzie, which is something that you told us a little bit about before. Can you tell us what that is for and why you need to use it? Yeah, it just helps pry apart the these, these are called frames and it helps pry apart and then lift up because they are very, they're very, um, they're like glued together. So you really have to get them separately. <clears throat> so I'm actually gonna bring this frame closer to Peregrine. It's gonna be okay. Oh, they're not this gonna fly. Is so amazing. So this is a frame of brood. Those dark brown ones in the center that are capped underneath all of those are developing bees. So the, when they're adults, they'll chew their way out of those holes and they'll emerge as, a, as an adult bee. <laughs> and then on the edges, you probably can't see, but on the edges, you can see uncapped have little white larvae on them. Wow, there are so many bees on that frame. This is really not a lot of bees on a frame. <laughs> oh, are there usually yeah, more bees on yeah, a frame? That is fantastic. We've been uh, getting a lot of questions um, in our chat. Um, is it all right if I just rapid fire some of them? Uh-huh. Um, so one uh, person is asking, what does regurgitate mean? <laughs> it means like throw up, like vomit. If you got a sick stomach, you know, you may throw up. So on, on this frame, do you all see any bees that are, that are different? <laughs> that may be a question, but there's some bees on here that are a lot bigger. I think I see one over there. I'm not sure if the yeah. camera can focus. I've got some glare. Here. So here, this is a drone bee. So there's a drone and a honeybee on my... And a drone bee is a male. And fun fact, the males cannot sting. We learned that recently because the this, this stinger is um, something called an ovipositor that they use to lay their eggs. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Mm -hmm. So only females have those. Oh. And the queen also cannot sting because her ovipositor is actually used to lay those eggs while the workers their ovipositor is, is modified to be a stinger that can sting. And I think this is a really, really great uh, 
point to answer some of the questions coming through around like how many bees and stuff like that. A hive like this one, if it's healthy, can have somewhere between 20 and 80,000 bees in it, which is wild. And of those 20 to 80,000 bees, most of them are females. All of the worker bees, so all of the bees that go out and do things like gather water and, uh, and protect the hive, those are all females. The others, there's only a few hundred males in there, and those are all those drones that Mackenzie just showed us. And then there's one queen who is, of course, herself also the female, which is pretty neat. So we're adding a little bit more of that smoke. Um, <laughs> sorry, go ahead. That was all. I was just saying that the smoke helps calm them down. Uh, we got some, a couple of questions about the queen bee is how can we tell the difference between the queen bee and the other bees and have you guys seen her before where is she yeah so she is it's it's unclear where she is right now she's usually somewhere in the middle of the frames and right now i haven't seen her yet in this hive but i i do know she's in the hive because of other signs i've seen which are eggs so i can see eggs in the cells, they would be very hard for you to see on camera. But if I see the eggs, then I know I don't have to look for the queen. Um, but that is something, whenever you check a hive, you always wanna make sure your queen is there. And if you don't physically see her, you can see the eggs. And you see the queen, because she's much bigger. Her abdomen is significantly longer, and that's because she has all those reproductive organs that are fully developed in her, in her that she's ready to use to lay all the eggs to create a colony. Thank you for that answer. That was really wonderful. Um, so how we have some more questions about kind of the bee natural history. How long do bees live? So in the, in the busy season, which is the spring and the summer, they only live a couple of weeks. They have very, very short lives. Um, but the bees who overwinter, so the bees that are in the hive once it starts getting cold until next spring, those bees can live several months. And that's a really good point, Mackenzie. What do those bees that are overwintering do? We don't see them at all during the winter time. So what are they, what are they doing? They cluster. So if you imagine like a basketball, there would be a, like a basketball sot, like cluster of bees inside the hive and they're just using their bodies to stay warm. Um, they don't do much, you know, they'll go up to eat, but they try not to break cluster as, as much as possible. You know, if we get a warm winter day, if it gets above like 55 degrees and sunny, they'll come out and they use the bathroom because they've been holding it all that time. Whoa. Something that surprised me, Mackenzie, is how little smoke that we're using. I was really surprised. I always thought that there was kind of a, a thick cloud of smoke going on the whole time. Yeah, too much smoke can agitate them. Oh. So, so in here, I wanted to show you all these cells right here. Do you see these bigger ones here? Those are where the drones are, are living. So these smooth ones are the worker bees, but these, because the drones are so much bigger, they need a bigger cell to live in. So that's where the drones are. Ones that kind of stick out, I see. Mm -hmm. Can you see the larva in there? Is that a good angle to see little white? What do you think, guys? I, I'm having a little trouble uh, telling just because of the glare on the screen. Can you it's guys see them? A, it's a little pixelated for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can't quite see it, but perhaps we can take some photos later and include those in a follow-up. That's a great idea. That is a great idea. We have some more questions about just the hive in general. Um, do be, how do the bees make, or do they make the honeycomb? Uh, the bees have in their, in their abdomen, they have special, so you know how the, the bee looks striped. Those are called plates that go around its body and they exude little wax scales, like little tiny flakes of wax from their abdomen, and then they take it and they, they mold it around to make to make the wax. Wow, they make it from their bodies. That's so cool. Mm -hmm. So I am going to go ahead and close up. 
but we can still talk about anything anybody wants to talk about. I love it. So what are you what have you determined from your hive check today, Mackenzie? What did you find out? I know that there is plenty of food, so they had lots of good honey storage in this box. I know that they're still making lots of brood. Um, I know that the queen is present because the eggs are there. Something I didn't talk about um, was disease, but I also didn't see any um, obvious signs of disease, which would be, you know, smell and things to do with how the brood pattern, so how they lay their eggs. There are things like that you look for to make sure there's no obvious signs of disease. One thing about this hive, though, is it is a little, it is, this is actually a little small. It's just too much room for them, so they haven't filled out uh, all these boxes yet. So probably in the next, you know, two to three weeks, I may reduce it, just take off one of these boxes and combine it so they don't have as much space to take care of. Because the more space they have to take care of, the harder it is for them, especially if they don't have the bees to take care of it. Oh, they need to downsize maybe. That's, that's right. <laughs> Somebody asked a great question. If you did find some sort of disease or perhaps a pest in there, like a hive beetle, would you be able to stop it? So hive beetles are not something that we generally worry about. The most hives, have hive beetles and you'll even see them when you when you open it up in there but they're not super destructive when you have really bad hive beetles and I'm talking several hundred then your problem's something else like the hive is already collapsed and dead and the hive beetles have come in to scavenge so one of the main pests that we look at for the honeybees is something called a varroa mite and you can put it into perspective as it's like if you had a tick the size of a basketball on your body, Ooh. that's what having a varroa mite is for a bee. And some bees can have more than one. So varroa mites are incredibly destructive to honeybee hives. And it's something that <clears throat> almost all beekeepers have to treat for. So you do have to apply some sort of pesticide um, to deal with your mite problems. Otherwise, they can, they can kill colonies very quickly. Wow. I was going to take a quick look back um, at our hive while you're uh, getting that uh, bee suit down, just so everyone can see how we've left it there. The little space at the bottom is mostly where they get in. Is that correct, Mackenzie? Right. Awesome. That and, was... and can you tell... Go ahead, Peregrine. Oh, I was just going to say, can you tell us about um, the pan of water at the bottom? Uh, so this colony has uh, a big ant problem here. We have. We have an ant problem in general around the ground. So we put the water there so that the ants cannot get into the hive and, and rob the, the sugar, the honey, and the nectar. Oh, so they have a moat. I they love have it. a moat. <laughs> they have a bee moat. That is so fantastic. That is really awesome. Well, it is now 1030, which means we are wrapping up. Peregrine and Mackenzie, I'll let y'all do some, uh, some closing thoughts first. Um, so Mackenzie, what are your closing thoughts from our hive check today? My closing thoughts are, I encourage everybody to plant as many native wildflowers as you possibly can, whether that be one in a pot or if you have some space in the ground to plant them. And it not only helps honeybees, it helps all of our, all of our native bees. And I encourage you to look into our, our native bees as well and see what you can do to help them as well. I bet we can find some native bees. Maybe uh, on our way out as we're walking back, I'll see if we can scan some of these. Oh, this button bush. Let's see if we find a native bee before we go. Oh, I see you. Yep, there's there's a bumblebee. That's, wow. Oh, see you later, bumblebee. That's probably our most common bumblebee that you'll see. That's wonderful. Well, Farrah I want to thank you all. Do you have a closing thought before we finish up? Uh, just be good, everyone, and <laughs> thank you for being here. Um, we really, really enjoyed uh, getting to kind of show this little behind the scenes. Uh, extra here, especially during pollinator week, where we appreciate all of the, um, the, the hard, hard work that our pollinators do for the museum and, of course, everywhere.
Jenna, do you have a closing thought before we finish up? Uh, just to uh, tack on to what Mackenzie said and to plant some pollinator friendly plants uh, in a pot or in your yard. And I'm really happy that we got to talk about something that is so cool and something that we all really love. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank, Thank you, you all so, so much. much, everybody. And there were so many excellent questions we didn't get to. We will include some photos in our follow-up email. But thank you so much for all of your most excellent questions and observations, my friends. So long and have a good rest of your day.